Good afternoon. Welcome to 30 Minute Reviews. I am Adam. Okay, so, um, two movies we're going to talk about today. Um, we have my favorite movie of the year, um, The Invisible Man. And then we have, um, what, uh, The Way Back, which I finally got to watch last night uh, with Ben Affleck. But first, let's talk about, um, news about the CW shows. If you if you listen to this podcast, you know I'm a big fan of what they do on CW. I love Flash, I loved Arrow, with the exception of season four. Um, I li- uh, love Legend of Tomorrow, all of that. Uh, I'm loving Stargirl, too. Um, I have not watched the second episode yet, but uh, I like the first episode so far. Um, Batwoman... Um, I kind of fell off watching, um, because my schedule went a little path. I didn't, I, I stopped watching, uh, not that I'm not going to go back to it now that it's on Netflix, um, that and Black Lightning I need to catch up on, um, season three of Black Lightning, and the episode, um, the second episode after Crisis, the one where they show off, um, Beth from an alternate Earth. Um, now, as with all the other shows on, uh, on not just the CW, but other networks too, because of the coronavirus, they had to suspend production, um, while they, you know, to prevent the infection of cast and crew. Um, so the show didn't quite get a proper season finale in the same way that you would in the past. That had like three episodes or always something like that. Um, it was announced last week, I think at this point, that Ruby Rose would be not returning for, um, season, what's it called, for season two onward of Batwoman. The show has been picked up for season two, um, but Ruby Rose will not be returning. Um, apparently the issue was that Ruby Rose did not like the level of intensity that goes into the production of a network TV show. And if you look at her past filmography, that makes sense. She's done a lot of movies. Orange is the New Black, The Meg, um, John Wick Chapter 2. Um, and while they may be lar- roles, large roles in the movie, and she may have a lot of screen time, and while she may have a lot of lock into production, it's not quite as intense as being the lead on a network television show, where you're putting in 23 episodes a year. And you are, you're the lead, so you have a, at least half the screen time in most of the episodes that you appear in. That's a lot of work, a lot of memorization of lines, a lot, it's a lot of time to put into it. It's also a lot of time to put into something and to constantly get attacked over. And when I say constantly get attacked, I'm referring to the fact that since the onset of Ruby Rose being cast, she has just been mercilessly attacked on social media. Um, she, at first, was attacked for not being, like, the the right, like, how do I put this? Like, I don't think she was, like, she's not a lesbian, I think, was what, she, what they attacked her for when uh, Kate Kane is, and it's like, yeah, but, like, she was like, that's ridiculous. And I think a lot of people were like, that's ridiculous. And to an extent, I think that was something that was co-opted by the more right-wing fringes of fandom um, to, you know, to to kind of try and stop the show from happening. It's like, well, we don't want her on there. We're not going to watch it. Um, and it's like, yeah, Really, that now you're not gonna like. Oh, you know, Ruby Rose is the issue will cast someone else. You're gonna watch it then. No, you weren't gonna watch it either way. Um, and then it's like um, she did like that happens with. Um, and then anytime anything happens, it's too social. It's too SJW. It's virtue signaling. It's too like you know too political. Um, the political aspect of it is the fact that she's a woman. And she's not straight. That's what they consider political. That's not political. That's just someone existing. Um, so they would people would always point to the ratings of the show and say the show is bombing. The show is only pulling a million viewers. 
Uh, keep in mind, the show was the number one show on the network for the first few weeks of the 2020 season. It, um, it was the number one show for the first few weeks of the 2020 season. Um, and I think on top of that, people don't really think about the fact that it was only beaten out by The Flash, which is the reigning number one show on the network, and Supernatural, which was in its 15th season and ending. And then Supernatural only pulled ahead as it got closer to the finale to see see how the show ended. People who hadn't watched the show in years came back to see how it was going to end up. And, And that's what I think a lot of people aren't quite understanding about this, is that, like, it wasn't, like, the show was, I saw someone say, like, oh, it's, a, it's such a poorly reviewed show to be a bad spot on her resume. Of course she jumped ship. No. She was the number three show on the network. That is unheard of. Typically, new shows on networks do not break the top five in their freshman year. The CW is kind of unique in that regard. And and this show was, too. Um, but then what happened is people are like, oh, she didn't want to do it. And it's like, oh, she's being a diva on set. And it's like, no. You wouldn't say that about a man. So stop saying that. It's not being a diva if she's she's not used to it and she's trying to get a, a, accustomed to something entirely new. And she it's not really what she thought she was signing on for, I don't think. Um... Because keep in mind, when she signed on initially, she signed on to do um, a half a season. And then it got extended. And then it got picked up. And we've heard, like, Grant Gustin talk about how he's missed movie opportunities. Um, he's missed, you know, theatrical opportunities because of being The Flash. But at the same time, he's like, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I just love being The Flash. And Ruby Rose may love the character. She may love playing the character and all of that, but from an aspect of a career, she she got more screen credits than Grant Gustin does, and Stephen Amell does. Like Stephen Amell, like played Casey Jones in um, what's it called uh, in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles two, but I can't really think of another role he was in besides that and Oliver Queen. I can't think of another thing besides uh, Glee that Grant Gustin was in. Melissa Benoist, I can't think of another role she was in besides, I think she was in Waco on Netflix. Um, much like how I talk about when we talk about Marvel, Marvel is the kingmaker. So anytime I see a fan cast of anything where they're like, oh, we're going to use an established actor, a big name actor, um, to do it, you got to consider that, like, Chris Pratt when he signed on to do Guardians of the Galaxy, was not Chris Pratt the movie star we have now. Chris Pratt, for Guardians of the Galaxy, was coming off of Parks and Recreation. He was a TV sitcom actor. Um, Robert Downey Jr. was at the lowest point of his career when he signed on to play Iron Man. Chris Evans was kind of an outlier, too, because he had big roles in Scott Pilgrim. He had big roles in... Um, in uh, Fantastic Four, um, but even that, he's gone to play Captain America, not a huge role at the time he was cast. Um, Chris Hemsworth was nobody before Thor. Tom Holland, nobody before Spider-Man. Um, Andrew Garfield was nobody before Spider-Man. You want someone with minimal screen credits while walking into their role. You don't want someone who could possibly walk out and you have to recast. Um, and I think that, like, when you see things like, oh, well, they cast Ben in the Cumberbatch as, um, what's it called? They cast Ben in the Cumberbatch as, uh, Doctor Strange. That was kind of an outlier. You don't really see that happening when you take a big name. Like, at that point, he had Sherlock under his belt, and he was a big name. Um, but even then, he wasn't headlining movies. Um, in the way that, you know, he wasn't headlining blockbusters. He wasn't a box office draw. As evidence by the fact that Doctor Strange kind of underperformed, despite being a really good movie. Um, so I, I feel like there was a lot going into it. But to say that she was being a diva or to or to, to, to attack her like that is just ridiculous. Just don't. Like, in all honesty, if she doesn't want to be there, it's better she do that 
than do what Carlos Valdez has been doing on the flash, who he visibly does not want to be there. He's been phoning it in for the last at least two years. Like, he comes in, makes his little quippy remark, laments the fact that he's not vibe anymore, and that's his screen time for the episode. But he visibly does not want to be there. But the thing is, he's too connected to the role now that you can't really recast him. You can recast her. There are other people who can play the character. Um, yeah, you're going to lose some of the audience because I, I know personally one of the people from work who I work with who started watching the show, she started watching it because I said, hey, Ruby Rose is in it. And she's like, oh, I love Ruby Rose. You're going to lose some people because of that. You're going to lose. Um, but you know what? I, I think that it's, you know, it's better for the longevity of the series um, that Ruby Rose is gone because I'd rather, in the same way I don't want Ben Affleck back, as Batman. Um, it's obvious that they aren't happy doing it. And while I may like them in the role, it their personal mental health um, and their personal, you know, their personal health is substantially more important than, um, than, than my person, than, you know, who I want to see in a role. If it makes them unhappy, why? Like, who am I to say they should force themselves to be unhappy for my benefit? So I wish her the best, and I'm looking forward to see who they cast in their role and see where they go from here. Um, so, and, and by the way, they're not going to do multiverse shenanigans. They're not going to do anything like that to uh, to, to introduce a, the new character playing Batwoman. It's just going to be, like, soap opera style. Like, the role of Kate Kane is now being played by whoever they cast. Or, like, uh, Iron Man 2, where they just kind of, you know, uh, they just kind of cast someone, you know, they, they recast uh, Terrence Howard as Don Cheadle, and kind just didn't acknowledge it. Um, where, it, or, they're not going to, like, you know, kill off Kate and replace her with someone else taking on the cowl. It's going to be the same character doing the same thing. Um, so let's talk about this week's movies. Uh, this week's movies, we're going to talk first about The Invisible Man. Um, I'm not a big horror fan, but I am a fan of the Universal Monsters. Um, because the Universal Monsters kind of come from an era where, when we talk about science fiction, I think I talked about this a few weeks back, when I talked about Her um, Heir to the Empire, too. Um, when we talk about science fiction, um, at the time, it was designed to be... Uh, cautionary tales, and, and and all science fiction, um, is typically is you know at its core a cautionary tale about why shouldn't you do whatever it is you know that they're doing. So like in Air to the Empire, well in in episode four of Star Wars, I mentioned the Clone Wars in passing, but never went any deeper into what it was. Air to the Empire comes out before the prequels, and they discuss the um, the Clone Wars as you know someone with a cloning facility. Um, cloning an army and trying to take over the galaxy, and the Grand Army of the Republic has to stand against it. Now, that's not what happened um, in the the in the movies as established, but it's an interesting way, because at the time the book came out, cloning was a topic of conversation, and people were afraid of what would be the downside of cloning, and that would have been an interesting way to go in the movies, and I'm disappointed we didn't get that. Instead, we got banking clans, secession movements, and all of that, and, and, and but with another, you know, what, what basically is another galactic civil war, um, but, you know, I digress. Now, Frankenstein, the moral of the story is don't, you know, don't, uh, don't play God. And that's what a lot of these are. Don't mess with things you don't understand because there could be ramifications you don't know. The mummy don't, you know, you don't know what curses could be, could be there. The creature from the Black Lagoon came from fears of searching the deeps of the ocean. You may find something down there that's, you know, homicidal. Uh, the Invisible Man... Uh, in this regard, is a very good telling of that story because it's a te it's telling what's the worst we could do with this technology, while at the same time also you know making it timely and relating it to people in a way that makes the most sense. Um, it, it's something that you can see happening in everyday life, where it's like it's a it's a, at its core it's a story of a stalking abusive ex uh, ex boyfriend who's emotionally and physically abusive to. Um, to someone, and um, this is hands down the best horror movie I've seen in a long time. 
um, before anyone gets up in arms. I have not seen Us. I have not seen Get Out. I have not seen A Quiet Place. Let me get that out of the way right now. Uh, so having not seen those, this is the best horror movie I've seen in a long time. Because what it is, it's not paranormal horror. Where this is something where, you know, it's, it's horror that takes place in the near future. With technology that could someday exist. And like, you know, nearby. Um, and it's it's so well done. Um, where you you feel the fear through the entire movie and the dread and I think that's what makes good horror work is it builds on a sense of dread that we know something's coming and it when it when it gets there it's going to and you know something bad's going to happen and it, it, it's there also I like the way they showed the invisible man uh, and what the suit was with all the with all the cameras is because of that it, it took on a kind of like it, the suit when you can see the suit and you can see him in the suit, he still doesn't look human. So it still looks like even that looks um, weird. And I think that this is a really good way to do the Dark Universe. And had they done this in the beginning instead of making the mummy as basically a uh, a Tom Cruise action movie, had they let off with this and then do a Frankenstein movie or something similar... Um, do a Dracula movie, something similar, because the story of these shouldn't be, um, shouldn't be, here's a monster, let's kill it, it should be, here's a monster, here's why it's a monster, here's how we cause the monster to exist, let's kill it. Um, so I'm looking forward to see, because I know Blumhouse is now handling more of the universal monsters, like the Wolfman, and Frankenstein, Dracula, and the Mummy, the Creature from the Black Lagoon. Um, it, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out and how it how it goes forward. Um, I, I, I I just really love this movie. If you've not seen this movie, it's available on DVD now. You can go to the Walmart and pick it up. Um, definitely worth your time watching. Um, I mean, the, the premise itself hooked me in to the point where I saw this movie in theaters. Um, and, and to be honest, I don't see horror movies in theaters. I'm a pussy. Um, and I went and saw this in theaters. Um, but it is so good. Um, you have to check this movie out if you haven't seen it. Now, on the other end, um, this is a movie that's not quite, uh, we have The Way Back. The Way Back's a very straightforward story, I thought, until we got to the end of it. Um, and, and let me get it out of the way. This movie is carried on Ben Affleck's very broad shoulders. Um, because he puts such a tremendous performance in this movie. And I, I didn't mention um, Elizabeth Moss' performance in the last movie. I feel like that's an, an injustice. She also carries that movie on her back um, playing, you know, her, like, playing basically terrified the entire movie. She does such a good job um, in there as well. But this, as you can tell, was a deeply personal story for Ben Affleck. The story of an addict and showing addiction gone wrong and, and, and losing everything because of addiction and getting, you know, getting his life together a little bit. And then that, that specter is always there. And it comes back and, you know, it takes from you. And it's, it's such a moving story. And it's so well done in that regard. And, and the basketball sequences are also well shot. That's something else that... When, you, when it comes to sports movies, that's something that is important, um, to me at least. I want well-shot sports action. I don't want view like I'm watching it. I want to feel like I'm on the court. And this movie does that very well. And despite the fact that the basketball takes up very little of the movie, um, one of my favorite sequences in the movie is the uh, the game that they're, they're playing. They come from behind to win. Because it's so fast-paced and rapid-fire with how it works uh, in that sequence that when you get to the, uh, that you, you like, it's not quite Creed when when Rocky goes, you're going to get out there and you're going to knock him down. We'll call that a win for you. Um, and, you know, it, it, it's like that. that's what you want. You want to feel the adrenaline that the players feel. And that's what this movie does. You get that from this. Um and the story is kind of bare bones, because you have the alcoholic, he wants to get his life together, and he, you know, he gets a job, he doesn't want the job, but he takes it anyway, as, as a coach of a high school basketball team. 
and it, it, it's cool in that regard. Uh, and then he he relapses, which is in a story like this not something you usually see. You don't usually see the relapse. You see him recover, and you see him recover alongside the team. The team's doing better, and you know, and and you know he relapses anyway because life still happens, and, and that's what happens in real life. And you can t- you can tell that this was what I, what I was thinking of when I was watching it is Judy Garland in um, the 1954 A Star is Born, where she, like, uh, with, with, when she talks about overcoming addiction and all of that, and she talks about how um, she's afraid he won't go to love her, she was a uh, uh, lover husband when, when she, uh, when he, you know, when he recovers, he's got the alcoholism. Um, that scene where she's, you know, she's backstage and she's sobbing and she, you know, puts her makeup back on, cleans herself up and goes out and performs, um, that's what I was thinking of through this movie is that this is a character that they don't have to, like, that, like, is so deeply intimate to who they are as a person because they were that person that you can see them really dig in deep and really pull it in because it's very easy for someone to compartmentalize that part of them if that's them and then, like, you know, have to play it like a role. But this is, there's a level of, I keep saying intimacy, but it's a, there's a level of intimacy to it where he's letting you into that part of his life. And showing you what what's it called, and showing you what um, what it was like for them, um, and it, it's just beautiful. Um, it's not as good as The Invisible Man as a, as a movie on a technical standpoint. Um, it's just like kind of like most of the story until you get to the ending is kind of gets bland. And then when you get to the ending, you get to... Uh, you, they kind of fast-track his recovery. But I, I feel like the movie... And, and the thing is, I'm a big fan of the Hour 40 movie. Um, if you listen to this podcast, you, you, know, you know you know that. If you, if you can get me in and out of a theater in an Hour 40, I'm, you are my best friend. Um, especially if the, if the movie works. But the issue is, it, it does... Like, it could have benefited from a little extra screen time. And it was, there was another movie I watched recently that I feel could have done the same thing. A Mighty Wind I watched recently was another movie that I felt could have done that, where it's, like, a little more character development, maybe, like, an extra 10 minutes, 10, 20 minutes could have done done wonders for the movie. Um, but, like, it, it's so well done. Uh, if you have not seen either of these movies, definitely check them out. Uh, definitely worth your time to watch. Um, and with that, we are done for today. Um, we'll be back next week. We'll be doing two movies next week as well. We will be doing uh, Justice League Dark Apocalypse War and Superman Red Sun, uh, both of DC animated movies that were put out this year. Um, if you follow me on Twitter at 30 Min Review, um, between now and Friday, uh, tomorrow, uh, Friday the 28th, if you retweet the tweet on my Twitter account, uh, I'm giving away a free copy of The Invisible Man. Um, so. If you uh, want to enter that, follow the account and retweet that um, before tomorrow night at 11.59 p.m. uh, Eastern Time, um, New York Time. So until then, we uh, have a great rest of your week. We'll be back with another uh, another great episode next week of talking about DC animated movies. Um, So until then, have a good week.